how many of you in our group here has, um, is somewhat familiar with yoga? Oh, wow, almost everyone. OK, <laughs> you're making it easy for me. <laughs> and how many of you um, have heard of or somewhat familiar with Ayurveda? OK, so um, we have a very qualified audience. How many of you are familiar with organic farming? <laughs> OK, so um, this presentation, um, I'm going to focus on um, some of the approaches I used on my farm in Bedford, New York. Um, and I wanted to just start by um, introducing the music that I played as you came in and you saw all the different seeds from the farm. Um, that is called the Gayatri Mantra. I ha how many of you are familiar with the word Gayatri? Great. This is going to be fun. Maybe you all should, it should just be a conversation. <laughs> so um, Gayatri is Sanskrit, and the, the agriculture I'll be talking about is Vedic agriculture. And uh, Gayatri is part of that body of knowledge from the Vedas. And just as a quick introduction, Gayatri um, means the form from which all comes. It's the original vibration from which all form comes. And it demonstrates unity and diversity which underlies all of creation. And it celebrates the underly underlying oneness and at the same time celebrates all the diversity. And one of the examples I like to give when trying to explain this idea of oneness is we know that gold is always the same metal but it can be fashioned into different um, pieces of jewelry, or it can be used for industrial uses, or you can use it um, on some food. So in the same way, this um, oneness that um, is the source of all creation fashions itself into all the different forms and phenomena of creation. And what I want to try to unpack here a little today is um, how it manifests. Just that spongy level from where it's consciousness until it's matter. That's what I'm going to talk about. And talk about the techniques that can be used on a farm utilizing some of those practices that were developed at that very powerful level <laughs> of manifesting. OK, so um, we'll just get started. And I'll leave time for questions later. But um, if someone wants to add something in, um, I'm open to that as well. OK, we don't have too big of an audience today. So the name of my farm is Amba. And it means wise mother. It's, a, again, a Sanskrit word. I started the farm about 10 years ago. And I'm just going to show a, a series of slides. And I utilized the basic agricultural practices from Dan and really enriching the soil and having our own compost. But I also applied many of the different techniques of Vedic organic agriculture. And some of that includes diff uh, using different Vedic recitations or frequencies or vibrations um, played at certain times that stimulates the basic underlying intelligence of the plants at those particular stages of growth. Also applying it to water, um, the water absorbs that very coherent frequency. What ended up happening with the farm um, and um, I was delighted with it, is the quality of the food that we started to grow became sort of well known in our community of Bedford and Westchester. And also the um, yields that we had became really dramatic. I, I think yeah, we're looking at some of the fruit trees. On my little three-acre farm, 
we were producing thousands and thousands of pounds of fruit. And when Dan visited, this is why he asked me to come do a talk, is because um, there was, there's just this feeling of coherence and um, a energetic life force that many people pick up on. And as a result, the farm started to become a, um, a gathering place for a lot of friends and people in our community. I stopped doing farmer's markets outside of the farm because um, people wanted to come to the farm and just walk around and bring their kids to the farm. So um, I'm using this opportunity to share some of the things that we did. One of the customers that we had, um, there, are <clears throat> there are a number of different celebrities that live just north of New York City. And one of the customers we had was um, Ralph Lauren and his family. They live not far away. And their chef, she would come and buy our produce and prepare it for them. And she came to visit back at the farm and said that Mr. Lauren and his wife noticed that whenever they ate the food and their family ate the food, their mood changes. Their mood would change from being kind of rough or unsettled to just feeling very settled and satisfied. So then when they were opening their restaurant in New York City, the Polo Club, um, on Fifth Avenue, they asked if I would provide product for that restaurant as well which we did for a while, <clears throat> but the commute ended up being too much for us to do that. But we ended up, um, as a farm, never having a problem selling the food and not really having a problem with pricing the food either because the quality um, stood out for most folks who um, the restaurants, we service mostly restaurants and markets, they felt it was worth what they spent on it. So I want to move to this point of um, some of the current conditions we have with so many of our farmers um, and kind of contrast to what we were able to create on our small farm. So some of the conditions, and I think this is the, a tiny list of so many issues that we have. Um, how many of you are familiar with this USDA study from 1940 to 2010? Yeah, I see a lot of nodding heads, where they found that in every family of vegetables and fruits, um, at least 70% of the nutrition was gone between 1940 and 2010. And I think the next study in 2020 isn't going to be any better news. Um, that's what we're facing, this like, precipitous decline. And uh, as a result of the agribusiness and some of the older farming practices, well, a lot of them are still used, we have this issue of depleted poison soils um, and also all our different waters and waterways. Um, as a result of this type of agriculture. <clears throat> when I was, um, I, I was asked to be a part of a symposium at the Northern Westchester Hospital, and one of the doctors who heads up um, Doctors Who Do No Harm, an international organization, he said that um, across the world, um, when they test babies, fetuses in utero, they're already locating over 200 toxins and pesticides that that baby has from the start. So the amount of um, alarm that all of us felt, it's hard to express, but it's also showing how widespread these issues are of um, the toxicity that we keep layering in, hoping our bodies will handle. We also, and I, I'm referring to Dana Farber's website here, um, the alarming rates of um, all different types of cancer 
that have been growing um, a lot in the U.S. and also in other developed countries. Um, so many of my farmer friends who um, their parents grew conventionally, their parents are suffering with different cancers that we quietly think are related to the toxins that they use during their years of being farmers. There's also this huge problem that the younger generation is not taking the mantle of the retiring generation. There are fewer farmers. And then also, this is so disturbing and kind of more recent that the suicide rate in farmers in the US is twice that of that of veterans, which we know is an alarming rate. We know that India has had this suicide rate in farmers for many years now. Um, but we're at this stark um, fork in our road. And I don't want to share this information to depress you. I just want to show this because I want to contrast um, what I'm going to focus on. Um, I think for many of us, the reasons I laid out are some of the reasons we come to the conference. And um, I think every single person who's in our audience, um, let me just ask for a show of hands, how many of you are involved in some sort of organic farming, um, food production, health care, um, nutrition, yeah, everyone. So what I want to do is ask that we inspire one another because we see these huge statistics, but in truth, there's this growing momentum that each one of you contributes greatly to. And um, as you know, our conference gets bigger every year, but also um, there's traction in us starting to move in better directions for our nutrition and for our soil. I'm featuring a few farmers from this one book um, that was published in 2012. If anyone wants to look at it, it's called Organic and it features a number of farmers and chefs from the Hudson Valley. And um, each one of them um, there's a page of a photograph and then also their story. And if we had the wherewithal, we should do that for our whole group here. Each of you should have your picture and your story because each one is equally treasured in what we need to do for our planet and for our human health and all the plants and creatures on our planet. So I'll just um, cycle through, and I'm guessing maybe some of you might even know some of these folks. Dan Barber, um, we all, a lot of us know him. He's been a great spokesperson for uh, food supply. He's in uh, Pocantico Hills um, in Westchester. Um, and that's his story. Kelly O'Hearn from Hawthorne Valley Farm. Anyone familiar with Hawthorne Valley Farm? Yeah, many of us are. Jack Algiers from Stone Barns. Jean-Paul Cortens. I know he has a couple of friends here, yeah. Um, a great biodynamic farmer, runs a huge CSA. I haven't met this lady, Lynn Fowler, but her family's owned a farm since 1910, and she um, farms in the Hudson Valley. Rich Focht from Hummingbird Ranch. Um, he specializes in bees and honey. And then this, um, this is a picture of me, and um, I purposely wore a meditation shawl because on my farm, <clears throat> I coined this term of inner and outer sustainability, that we focused deeply on um, wise stewardship of the land and conserving and improving the resources. 
but also I've had a l almost lifelong interest in practice of meditation. And um, so our farm became sort of a combination of taking care of growing, but also we oftentimes had classes there or group meditations or yoga conferences or just different methods, Ayurvedic conferences, to promote health and longevity within our, ourselves as well. So this is, these are some of the points I'm hoping to cover today, plan to cover. Um, I'll describe the, Vedic, the body of Vedic knowledge a little bit and give some background on it. There are eight subtle forces and aspects in nature that combined are called a Sanskrit world word prakriti. And we'll go over that a little bit and go over kind of the structure of it because it's at the basis of that prakriti that all of our um, internal forces function, whether it's our body or our mind. And it's also how nature manifests on our farm. There are, in the Vedas, they go, it's a very complete system of agriculture. The Vedas are thousands and thousands of years old. Um, and they had the ability to grow plants that included these five embedded traits in plants that I'll review and go over, um, that once they're that potential is unlocked and the, the seeds can produce that, they have very great benefits on folks' health and well-being. And then um, I include nine steps, just very simple practical steps for anyone who wanted to include some of these practices. Okay? I wanted to give a little bit of background about myself. Um, I come from... Um, Southeast Cleveland, a town called Maple Heights. And my grandfather and his brothers immigrated from Slovenia. And they bought property kind of contiguous to each other. And they all started organic farms, which is what they had for hundreds of years back in Slovenia. And um, the one furthest on the left here is Uncle Joe. And he had a vineyard where he grew grapes and um, raised chickens and had a, a farm. And then my grandfather in the dark suit in the back, he lived with us. Um, there were seven children and there were 10 of us in this very small house. And he lived with us and we had our farm on that property. And then next to him in the back is Uncle Ludwig, who um, was an orchardist and he became a master grafter and also developed seeds for burpees. So we grew up organically growing and ran about the community as if that's how all Americans lived. Um, and then in our teens, we realized, well, actually, it's not how everyone lives. But I ended up coming back to farming kind of in a full circle later on in my life. One of the consistent threads of the different farms was each one had honeybees. Um, they, they needed it for the orchard, they needed it for the grapes, they needed it for the vegetables. So there was a shared pool of um, raising honeybees and we all used this man called the bee man. So I was probably about 10 years old and the four girls, we all shared a bedroom on the second floor and the living room was downstairs. I was up there by myself and I heard this really loud like um, motor sound. I, I couldn't figure out what it was. It was down in the living room. And I knew my grandfather was downstairs and I thought there was some problem. So I, I raced down the steps and I kind of peeked over into the living room and I was like, Grandpa, are you okay? And the bee man had come into the house with this post that had a wrapped rag soaked in sugar water and an entire hive 
which had decided to scatter all over the living room. And these, these two guys um, were very calmly sitting at the table, um, having shots of their Schlievowitz, their, their whiskey. And Grandpa's like, what's the problem, you know? They, the whole experience of farming and creatures, it was, it, it was all the same part of an ecosystem. And I'm always so grateful to him for inspiring that in me. Um, this is me. Do any of you know DJ Haverstrom? He's a great beekeeper um, working on my farm in um, Bedford um, with some beehives. I've learned some amazing tips from DJ about how to really care for bees in a natural way. Um, but that was just uh, one of the great gifts I received from my grandfather. Now, one of the things that um, I learned from him is he oftentimes, he had a beautiful tenor voice, and so oftentimes in the fields, he would hum or sing. And that just seemed to calm everything down. So on my farm, I got in this habit, um, because my lifelong interest has been Sanskrit and the Vedas, um, when I was working in an orchard, in my orchard, or like especially in a big squash patch that had lots of flowers, I would do this Vedic recitation that um, I thought I would do for you now, and then I'll show you on the screen the translation, and if you want, we could do it together. But it kind of reminds me of the feeling of bees, and um, I was never, ever disturbed by any of the the bees while I was working. So um, here it goes. <clears throat> Sahana avatu, Sahana bunatu, Saha viryam karavavahai, Te jasvi now ade vishve nishe du. And the next slide shows the translation of it. Let us be together, let us eat together. Let us be vital together. Let us be radiating truth, radiating the light of life. Never shall we denounce anyone and never entertain negativity. And just the vibration of that sound, I would just say it over and over, um, created a, an environment that was a pleasure to work in. So would you all like to try it? OK, what the heck? OK. Sahanav avatu, sahanau bunatu, saha viryam karavavahai, te jasvi nav adhitam astu, mad vidvashavahai. That's great. <laughs> well done. Uh, again, please. Could you show us the name of the text again? Oh, sure. It's um, from one of the Upanishads, Tatariya Samhita of the Yajurved. Sure thing. So I thought I would take a couple minutes to explain about the language of Sanskrit. Um, how many have heard about a language called Sanskrit? Let's start. So everyone, especially with yoga and Ayurveda, right. So how many of you have heard of Sanskrit referred to as the mother tongue of humans? Yeah. Um, oftentimes, that's its reference because there's no known language prior to that. A couple of the things, I'll just highlight maybe two or three things about Sanskrit. A couple of things is that Sanskrit is an anatomical language. It completely depends on how the human body is structured and the sounds that it can make. And that's how you produce your vowels and your consonants. And these are some of the basic characters of Sanskrit. It's a character language. And each of those characters has a very unique 
um, set of potentials as well. But if you just look at the diagram of the mouth, it's like a cross section of the mouth, there are five main places where the air can flow through your lungs, your exhalation, and you can have it stop in your throat, in your soft palate, in your hard palate, in your teeth, or on your lips. So I'll give a little demonstration of that. So the first sound for Sanskrit, and that's the first letter, is ah. Uh, do you all want to do that? Ah. Uh, it's just the open flow of expired breath, breath as we're exhaling. So then you say you stop the air in your throat. Ah. Uh, you end up with a full stop of a g or a k sound. Ag, ak. So then, if you stop at your soft palate, you end up with a little bit of a, um, they're called semivowels. Ah, it, it turns more into an S sound. And then at your hard palate, ah, it turns again into a, an S sound. Dental is against your teeth, and so you end up more with uh, t with your tongue behind your teeth. And then the lips or the labial is um, uh, all these different um, sounds that are created with your lips closed. So it's this entire flow of language just through the way that the body functions. And the reason I wanted to take a couple minutes to explain that is because all of the Vedic recitations and these um, Vedic vibrations that we use on the farm or in Ayurveda or in yoga, they come from this organic language that's expressed naturally through the human physiology. It's most suited to the human physiology, and it connects us to any objects that we're describing. So when I was about 10 years old, I mean 15 years old, um, 19, 1970, I think, um, I ran across this book, a brief biography of Walter Russell, the man who tapped the secrets of the universe. And in this book, I think it's like 60 pages long, it kind of described this man experiencing being a human being, just that experience of the self knowing itself and that unlocalized, unbounded consciousness within us. So I ended up learning transcendental meditation when I was 18. And it's a simple technique that allows your mind to settle down naturally and experience this deep, unbounded transcendence, which is within each of us. And that form kind of a foundation. Um, the technique was founded by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and he's probably mostly known for the TM technique. But what he did is he started a university in Switzerland for Vedic studies, to study the ancient uh, works of the Veda. And I ended up going to undergraduate school there, and that kind of started my whole interest in the Vedas. I'll describe them a little bit. They're a very unique body of knowledge. Veda itself is Sanskrit for total knowledge. It has the advantage that every single verse um, flows from this um, context of a universal oneness. So many times we're dealing with one thing or another thing where we, it feels all disjointed and unconnected, whereas in the Vedas, everything's connected back to this one original wholeness from which everything else, Gayatri, emerges. They're not books or texts. Although many of them are recorded in books or texts, originally they were an oral tradition, and then some like five or seven or 3,000 or 1,500 BC, some of them started to be recorded. 
And the, what the Vedas are is they're actually just the flow of pure life force. It's the flow of life force flowing through us and then expressed. The Vedas originate within human beings. There are human beings that have developed their consciousness enough that they're, they have the ability to see within themselves. How many of you have felt you've um, had some aha moments? That all of a sudden something clicks all together. You have these moments of cognition where it all pulls together. Um, there's a, a soft similarity between those moments within us and the ancient seers. They were called seers because their inner vision was clear enough to cognize the flow of the Vedas in this Sanskrit language. It's always cognized and recorded in Sanskrit and one of the most powerful features of um, almost all the Vedic texts is that the silent gaps between the syllables and the words and the, um, the padas, the, the phrases and the verses, those silent gaps is where the Vedas are the most powerful. They're the ones, the silent gaps contain all the transformation that takes place um, as a result of that, the Vedas. This is a point I, I want to bring out that in our science that's so instrument-based, some people feel that genetically modifying the DNA strand, they're just replacing a little protein here or there. It's not a big deal. But I think as time goes on, um, we'll start to understand that the information embedded in the gaps between the um, very compressed, um, compact information in the genetic stream is as important as those little proteins that emerge and we're kind of messing around with. So just to, um, I'll kind of quickly go through this. There are 40 branches to the Vedas, four main ones, and 36 other branches. Some examples that we may be familiar with are yoga, everyone raise their hand um, to that, that whole system of mind-body health um, through various postures and breathing and um, other recommendations. Ayurveda, Ayu is life in Sanskrit, knowledge of life, knowledge of lifespan. Tomorrow morning I'll give a talk on Ayurveda and how it relates to organic agriculture, but it's um, all plant-based medicine and um, it's been um, become such a household world word in this just this past generation. But its roots are, it's one of the 40 branches of the Vedas. Vastu, how many of you have heard of the word Vastu or Stapachaved? It's a form of architecture that is based um, on orientation, where you have the entrance to your home um, faced due east, cardinal east, and um, or cardinal north. It's all about. Um, bringing in the most positive influences to your dwelling and um, tracking the flow of sunlight and also the different placements of the rooms and the volumes of the rooms. Um, in architecture for 2018, the World Prize, as probably most of you know, for the best architect in the world is called the Pritzker Prize. And it's a huge honor, and many famous architects have received this. It went to a Vastu architect this year, um, Dr. Bal Krishna Doshi. I don't know if any of you know him. He's well in his 90s in India, and um, he's devoted his life to building these um, 
homes and dwellings and small villages and towns that are all based in these principles of living in tune with nature. Gatharvaved is the music of, of the Veda. And oftentimes, um, I'll play some Gandharva Ved, and I thought I might play a little sample today. Um, it's the melodies of nature. For example, there's a melody that you can play to invoke rain. There are different melodies that are suitable for times um, that sync with the Ayurvedic times of day, which are like from 6 to 10 in the morning, there's a certain influence from 10 to 2 in the afternoon, from 2 to 6, from 6 to 10. And there are specific melodies that support the energetics and the movements of the sun during those times. It just supports and creates this harmonious environment. I wanted to mention um, the Bhagavad Gita as well. The, how many of you have heard of the Bhagavad Gita? OK, <laughs> good. This is great. The Bhagavad Gita is considered the, one of the premier recorded texts of the Vedas. And it's this compact encyclopedia of Vedic knowledge. It's sort of the textbook that you can answer almost any questions. And the premise of the Bhagavad Gita, um, I taught it in college for many years. And I, I refer to it as a psychological thriller to my students. Uh, teenage or 20-year-old uh, students, because this very young um, warrior, Arjuna, is faced with this huge dilemma. He's at the top of this um, battleground with thousands of warriors, and he's faced with this choice, do I engage in this battle and kill thousands of my kinsmen, or do I step out of what my allotted duty is and not kill anyone. And he turns to um, Lord Krishna. Who, Lord Krishna is the manifestation of our deep inner self. And it's the dialogue between those two. It's only 700 verses that answers so many compelling questions. And I'm sure most of you have heard that um, hero of a thousand faces, that every one of us is a hero in a different face, but we all we all have to deal with these different dilemmas and difficulties in our life and make tough choices. So the Bhagavad Gita is all about making the tough choices and understanding why you make them. The Bhagavad Gita, as Maharishi describes it, it's a compact encyclopedia of all Vedic knowledge, a complete guide to practical life, presents the science of life and art of living, and it teaches us how to be, think, and how to do. Now, the Bhagavad Gita has, so, has inspired so many people. And I thought I would just pick one. It was hard to choose which one. But um, we all know Albert Einstein. And he became very inspired through the Bhagavad Gita. When I read the Bhagavad Gita and reflect how God created this universe, everything else seems so superfluous. I've made the Bhagavad Gita as the main source of my inspiration and guide for the purpose of scientific investigations and formation of my theories. One of the reasons I'm bringing these points up is because oftentimes, uh, even on Jeopardy the other night, one of the questions was, um, which is the oldest dead language? And the answer was Sanskrit. And I was like, guys, you know, um, it's not a dead language. And the Vedas are um, living and breathing through each one of us. It's that vital life force that th flows through each of us. And we are living our own Bhagavad Gita at all times. Within the Bhagavad Gita is the whole description of how creation manifests. And there's one fundamental principle that um, I'll describe at this point, um, and I mentioned it earlier, called Prakriti. It's these eight fundamental aspects of nature that form anything in creation. 
The word breaks down um, root-wise. Pra is to sprout. Kri is life-supporting action. And T is a feminine declension. One reason I wanted to break it down is because in the Vedas, farming is considered a sacred profession. It's uh, one of the most honored professions. And it's, um, in a poetic way, it was described at one point, you're putting your hand in the hand of the creator, that you are co-creating um, with the universal mother in growing food for her children. So it's a very revered profession in the Vedas. And the Kri of life supporting action and the name of Mother Nature is also in the word for a farm, Krishi, um, and then also for farmer, Krishak. So a farmer and the farm and Mother Nature are considered all the same basic root together. There isn't a separation. So we'll start with um, how this sequentially unfolds. And the first fundamental aspect is the ego, just our sense of I or individuality or a particular plant like a tomato or a cow or a pig. It's just the basic individuality. And then there's the intellect, which distinguishes and decides, the mind, which serves as the memory, the space or volume within which we move or we grow or build a space. And then we get to the elements, air, fire, water, and earth. These are the eight fundamental aspects that everything's created out of. And I wanted to show you, and, and it's always um, expressed in this spiral. Prakriti is this eightfold spiral. And I wanted to show you how often we see this spiral within nature. Um, so I just have included a few slides here showing the spiraling. And later, I'll explain the forces that go into creating the spiral um, that help us understand why it forms like that. At the Guggenheim Museum in New York City right now, there's this show by Hilda Off Klint. I don't know if any of you know her. She's a Swedish artist who painted in the earlier 1910, 20s, 30s. And she created this whole series of paintings that she felt she was divinely inspired to create these primordial images. But she wasn't, she asked for them not to be shown for many years because she didn't think people were ready to understand them. And then the Guggenheim has this retrospective right now. So I went to see it. So I'm just including some of her pictures because, again, you see this spiraling that she saw in so many of her pictures um, expressing these primordial uh, dynamics. And then this is the Guggenheim itself in her wish for the exhibition, this was many years ago, she wanted it to be exhibited in a spiral, um, which is, you know, as you all know, the Guggenheim is that spiraling. So this is where we'll get to a little bit of work here. So when we talk about the eight um, full property, the five um, elements come from essences, five essences. And those are called tanmatras. They're matter that's subtle. And the essences manifest as senses, but they also manifest as elements. And later you'll see they also manifest as forces. And so the essences um, of the five senses are hearing, touch, sight, taste, and smell. And those are related 
uh, on a one-to-one -one correspondence with space, air, fire, water, and earth. So we're starting to get our building blocks here of how things manifest both within ourselves, our bodies, and in our environment. So the essences each have names. Um, I just thought I would include it. Shabda is sound. It's associated with the element of space and hearing. Sparsha is touch, associated with air and feeling. Rupa is form, fire and seeing. Rasa is taste, water and tasting. And Ganda is smell, earth and smelling. Now each of these have a force that goes in different directions. The force associated with earth is called apana, and it's a downward force. And what we're working toward is this one slide that shows these eight stages of plant growth and how the elements and essences and forces come together as a plant grows through its cycle. So we have um, apana, which is downward. So it's, you plant that seed, and you start to get the downward roots starting to grow. Water is tasting, and it, the energy, the force is udana, or flowing. Fire is seeing, and that's samana, or transformation. Air, feeling, and the prana is the upward energy. That's where you're going to see um, the role of photosynthesis and the plant growing towards the sun. Space is hearing, and that energy is connecting. So when you combine these forces and these elements, you have a downward force, a flowing force, a transformational force, an upward force, and a connecting. It naturally becomes this spiraling um, form. It's described as that. The three other aspects to nature are the mind, which is the memory. That's where we will have in the genetic structure of our plants. It's the platform for perception, memory, insight, intuition for when we have our inner property functioning. Mahat is the intellect, which gives specific direction. And ahamkar is the ego, the sense of individu individuation or I. So this is kind of a summary of the different fundamentals and the energies that work with the elements. And then this leads right into these eight stages of plant growth. You plant the seed in the earth, and that's associated with the element of earth, smell, and the apana energy of roots going down to be established. Then you have your first rains or your moisture, which causes the seeds to swell. And then the sprouting is the, the transformational point where you have the different um, catalysts um, of chemistry happen and you bring life to that seed. Then you have your first leaves that identify the plant, which is associated with the upward prana. And you have the growth and extension of the plant, which is associated with space, the volume that plant or tree needs in order to grow. Then the flowering is the mind, remembering what the purpose of that seed is. And then fulfilling that purpose into bearing the fruit and then moving to a new seed or crop. And one of the reasons this is significant is um, there are recitations or these Vedic vibrations that you play at each of these stages that support the full intelligence of the next stage of the growth of the plant. Rudolf Steiner um, was a, uh, he gave 10 different lectures on the Bhagavad Gita, this whole body of creation and 
um, subtle knowledge. And this was his description, human creative forces have a very special relationship to all the other forces of nature. It's natural that man, as he is, simply cannot know some part of his being. Man gains knowledge of the world he lives in because the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms are outside him and he can observe them. So there's this whole self-referral dynamic that happens with our own inner nature, property, and outer nature, even though they're made of the same thing and they come from the same source. And that self-referential, we learn and gain from it and grow in our consciousness while we're growing our plants. That's the intention of Mother Nature, is to have that synergistic relationship with what we're growing. This just, it's from the Panemiya Shiksha, which is a, one of the aspects of the Vedas. And it just simply describes how um, through breath, Prakriti expresses herself in the human being. The self stirs with an intention, that's the ego. Together with the intellect, it takes a direction and engages the mind. The mind strikes the fire in the body, which in turn drives out the air. The air moving within the lungs causes the emergence of subtle sound, which becomes sound, the reverberation of the self. So that's kind of the whole cycle of property coming out and us expressing that. One of the reasons I went into this is um, there's a tremendous amount of, in the Vedas, there's a tremendous amount of focus on the use of um, attention and intention in our consciousness. How many of you are familiar with um, applying attention or using intention? So quite a few. Be interested in your experiences. So there's a tremendous body of Vedic wisdom about these two um, ener energetic faculties we have within our own awareness. Intention, in Sanskrit, the word sankalp, and it's a very simply stated desired outcome. Uh, it's a direction or purpose that we want. Um, it, attention, in Sanskrit, it's dhyana, and probably many of you know that from yoga practice. And it's the, just the flow of awareness in our mind. But it's a clear um, flow of attention um, is the most powerful center for fulfilling any desire. And we'll talk about this. First, with our sun cult, we're deliberately directed. We have a specific intention. Like, say, for example, in... Um, in Vedic agriculture, when you go to plant your seeds, you, you have your seeds um, and you have an intention for those seeds. You take that moment to have an intention for them to come to life and to grow to their full potential and to enjoy their full potential and then to help feed um, the creatures on earth because that's their purpose. And you just quietly have that intention, or you can quietly have an intention that we need rain, or we need something else. And it helps um, store, stir, steer, steer, stir. It helps stir, sorry, um, the consciousness within our environment to bring that purpose back to us, to fulfill that purpose. So um, the intentions are most effective when we can project them from a quieter, more silent level of our inner awareness. If we're all angry and agitated and stressed out, oftentimes the, atten the intention won't hit the target because it's coming from a place of chaos rather than coherence. But for farmers and farms, 
we are the emissaries of Mother Nature. We're her expression. And so this is how she wants, this is how she operates, and this is how we can culture the ability to operate. I worry about farmers because it, there's so much work and we can get so exhausted that we necessarily, we need to employ some of these more subtle strategies that are very powerful in order for us to be sustainable. Um, we know that we want permaculture in our land and sustainability in our soil, but we need that within ourselves as farmers. So that is to help start utilizing some of these subtler faculties. Intention, it's simply the flow of, I mean, attention, the flow of awareness in our mind. But this is an important point. Our awareness is bi-directional. So it can um, look outward and we can have our attention on our fields or take stock of our trees or our kids or just sort of try to understand what's going on. But it's also, um, it can be an inward direction as well. Our attention can go inward. And oftentimes this happens very automatically. We're viewing a field and then we're accessing our memory of what we need to do to help take care of that field. Um, but as the um, ability grows for intention and your flow of attention, the bi-directionality becomes more significant. Because when you quietly have your attention on a specific goal that you want to accomplish, or an understanding of what needs to be done, that life force of attention, that's what attention is, it's just pure life force. Um, it's, it's bringing it to life. It's bringing it to a place where you're communicating that to your environment. Because the consciousness within us, this the whole principle of oneness, is also the consciousness of the whole farm or environment. That's why it's almost the same name. It's Krish E or Krish Ak. So our flow of attention and intention permeates the farm as well. And it's something that needs to be cultured, but over time, you'll find that. Um, Nature conspires with you to accomplish um, certain tasks for better yields, healthier plants. And it may sound um, exaggerated, but so many times I, I can share that I'll just say, go, oh, I need another, you know, I'm going to have extra greens in this field. I need another buyer for that amount of greens, and I'll get a phone call that I, I have another restaurant that needs a product or another farmer that their field didn't do well. There's this whole infinite, infinitely correlated field. We know about the microbial web, right? We know about how that works in our soil. That actually is a whole invisible web within our environment as well. And when we create a more coherent environment, on our farms, in our families, that web is electrified. It's enlivened. It's the flow of life and intelligence that is connecting everything. How many of you have felt they've been successful with their use of attention and intention? Oh, more than half. Okay, so I'll preach you to the choir here a little. <laughs> no. So we sometimes call attention um, lamp at the door because you can see on the outside and then you can consult or experience your own silence on the inside. And I was just giving an example there, which I talked about already. There's another piece of um, the power of attention. And for those of you familiar with the Yoga Sutras, for example, you know that Patanjali, in his four chapters, I think it's what, 244 sutras, he 
he devoted so many of the sutras to the topic of attention. He dev I think he devoted three sutras to asana and several sutras to pranayam. But really, the bulk of his sutras relate more to the role of attention, intention, and settled awareness. If you, I brought some um, translations if anyone wants to take a, a look. But it's because of the significance of the flow of our life force, our consciousness, through our um, paying attention. Whatever we put our attention on, this is from the um, a Vedic piece of advice, it's what grows stronger in our life. And so um, that's why it's always good to put your attention on life-supporting influences. As farmers, Kri is life-supporting. We don't want to go out and destroy our plants or destroy um, life. We're looking to create life. So that is one of the reasons why um, farms have the potential to be these lighthouses of peace and coherence in their communities. And also for farmers to grow into their own self-realization and enlightenment because it's this constant flow of attention on life-supporting um, choices to promote life and health and well-being. In opposition, and this is from the Bhagavad Gita, um, should we decide to put a lot of attention on negativity and um, say, share that in the environment, speaking ill of others um, or gossiping in a mean-spirited way, um, what Lord Krishna described to Arjuna is that puts, um, it puts a, a filth in your heart where you um, can no longer have pure nature survive in that. So this idea of putting your attention on a lot of negativity really decreases your own inner capacity um, to enjoy your own life. It's um, another point that's made is you may be putting poison into your environment, but you're giving the biggest dose of poison to yourself. So that's, I think, so many of us. How many of you feel like you want to protect your environments from negativity or um, dark influences? I think most of us, it's just our instinct or our nature to do that. The Vedas are so replete in these validations of our subtle instincts. Our subtle instincts are the Vedas. Now once you, and this is really illustrated in the Yoga Sutras, I think chapter four devotes most of itself to the attention and intention combined. We could say that attention is like the left hand and intention is like the right hand. And when they're combined, um, you're capable of accomplishing so many things from this quieter level before you set out to physically accomplish them. Um, one of the habits, how many of us write lists of what we need to get done? That's a combination of attention and intention. Um, it's, and how many of you find in doing that, that a lot of the list tends to resolve itself on its own? The, the circumstances conspire around the desire for that. Well, in the Vedas, they offer different practices to make that um, completely powerful and consistent so that it's, it's your primary tool belt is attention and intention. Once that is awakened, attention and intention, in the Yoga Sutras you can read there's this huge plethora of human faculties that are innate within us that have not yet become well known. And one of the reasons I bring this up is because in the way that the uh, organic, Vedic organic agriculture describes itself, when we eat those plants and those products, 
it offers the subtle intelligence and coherence and frequency that helps open up these faculties of attention and intention. Um, one that you'll read about in the Yoga Sutra is called Ritambara Pragya, um, the level where truth is known, or Pasha, this clear inner seeing or inner hearing, and then also this ability um, so many farmers describe they'll go out in their fields and they'll feel this communication with nature that this needs to be done and we need to be proactive about this and that leaf, oh, I know what that plant needs. How many of you feel that when you're out in your fields? Yeah, it's just this natural part of Kri. We're all the same nature. We're all the same mother nature functioning from different um, perspectives. So these are the five latent traits that um, in Vedic organic agriculture we should be able to easily bring these out in the potential of our seeds. Coherent frequencies, coherent pulse, maximum vitality, a crystalline structure within the water of a plant, and a holistic substance that develops in the plant itself and then also further develops in the digestion and absorption of the food. So current coherent frequencies, some of these points we know over and over again. Um, plants respond to and they absorb the frequencies from different sounds, and a number of books have been written. How many of you are familiar with this concept already? Yeah. Um, and there are quite a few studies that the music of the Vedas, Gandharva Veda, um, Dorothy Redelak in 1973, she played all different sorts of music, and the Gandharva Veda grew, they, it grew at a 45 degree angle toward the um, music as opposed to moving so far away from it like some of the other music did. Um, also Chandra Bose in the early 1900s and then again Dr. T.C. Singh and um, in the reference it also said there were over 50 other studies done about this Gandharva Vade music. So I'll just play a little bit of it. Um, And you can see what you think. You can think uh, um, how it might uh, be affecting you. What? Oh, OK, thanks. Can you hear? So that's an example of a vocal. Um, and then I, I wanted to mention, I, I subscribe to this app called Marshi Veda, which you can, um, you can have access to all these different Vedic recitations, including different Gandharva Veda music. Um, let's see. I wish I was better at this. This is the rain melody. If we need rain. I play this in the summers.
kind of hard to stop it. How many of you enjoyed that? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a nice experience. I do. Um, <laughs> I know what I ended up doing um, is I, I ended up digging a trench and laying um, uh, audio wire inside of a, a pipe and then in the center of my fields I had a speaker and then I um, created different playlists there and and if anyone wanted a workshop on the playlist you can create I would create different playlists because there are different um, times for the the different constellations that the moon's in and um, the sun in different seasons and um, when you're planting or when you're harvesting so there's and they're all beautiful but I just play the the playlist I don't call me crazy <laughs> <laughs> But plants respond to these frequencies, and also it does create this very coherent environment um, on your farm itself, and with the, the folks who work on the farm as well. Um, going to a co coherent pulse, Dr. Chandra Bose, in the early 1900s, he made the original observation, which has been repeated many times, that um, the cortex tissue of growing plants exhibits a pulsing dynamics, which common sense tells us that. And it's those pulsing uh, that um, push the sap upward, um, somewhat similar to our heartbeat. Now, with that coherent pulse, the plants have the ability to align itself with um, what's going on in the environment. Um, the pulse of plants, it changes due to different temperature and times of day, often like our own human pulse. The plant's natural potential, if it's healthy and growing strong, is that pulse um, is the same cosmic pulse of that time and season um, that's going on. So then when we harvest the plants and we have these coherent frequencies within the plants and this pulse, we're taking in all this subtle intelligence into our digestive system. The food is bringing that to us, as well as all the nutrients and micronutrients. It's all these different um, coherent structures of intelligence that feed our body in different layers. Then there's this point of maximum vitality. Um, when we play the Vedic recitations, and um, there's one you can get that's the first and last verse of each of the 40 Vedas, it helps enliven the total, the total intelligence of that particular plant. And um, that provides the ability to have a healthy, structure and function within your plant. As the seed, and, and again, when you go through those eight stages of plants, and I, I think I'll show that again, um, when you go through those eight stages of plants, you'll see um, that each of the 40 aspects serves a couple of the different stages of those plants. So here's the eight stages of plant growth. And the different 40 aspects help enliven the intelligence um, within the plant um, genetics to let it become its full potential and this full, subtle nutrition. Also, the, there have been early experiments showing that the fluid, like the sap, within the... Um, you know how we use the sap for our refractometer. Um, it exhibits these very interesting crystalline structures that are highly coherent, just like we saw in some of the experiments on water and what um, influenced water in different ways. 
that's exhibited in the plants, which again is what we want to ingest, is that um, very coherent structure into our bodies. Then there's this other point that um, is extremely important. In the Vedas, there's this one um, verse, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And so what we're, um, what we're seeing with plants in Vedic organic agriculture is as you have the coherent frequency and pulses and crystalline structure, um, it's called vital quality. It's the um, how fresh and vital, how much prana, are you familiar with the word prana? How much life force is in that plant um, and can be con conveyed to us as we eat it? That's all what is collected into this concept of vital quality, that it brings vitality into our system. We know if we eat old food, we never want to eat rotten food, that can weigh us down, that can um, cause indigestion. But this vital quality, this high prana value, um, completely raises the intelligence and consciousness of those who eat it. Now, an additional substance is created when you have this high level of vital quality. And Dan came up with this comparison. I have to give a nod to Dan. Um, he called it um, like a fifth octave in music. You know how you have people in harmony and then there's another overtone in music. There's a product that the plants can create called soma. Um, is anyone familiar with soma? And then even more so when this vital quality is ingested into the body, the digestive system has the capacity to create soma. And soma is this very fine digestive fluid that um, allows for the most absorption and um, assimilation of nutrients but it also acts as this lubricant for consciousness. And it helps integrate the flow of consciousness and intelligence into the physiology. The practical steps for a farm. We recommend choose a field that receives morning sun, um, oriented east if possible. Hopefully you can get that full morning sun. Um, a lot of the best organic practices that we use are the same that are described in the Vedas as well. Just you avoid all the toxins and artificial, chemically designed products. You treat the seeds before planting. Um, we oftentimes do that with inoculant. Oftentimes in the Vedas, it's with also uh, diluted yogurt and dung um, or a, um, with the intention. Sometimes um, you, farmers breathe. They take their breath and, and breathe onto their seeds. Or sometimes they'll put some saliva in some water and put that on their seeds. It's krishi and krishak. You're giving your life force to your seeds. Um, and it's all the same original base that we're living from. Observe the sunrise and sunset. Um, it's part of us just being in tune with the cycles of nature. But in um, the Vedic agriculture, it's, it's recommended that you express some appreciation or gratitude to the sun that's rising and the sun that's setting. And another uh, important piece is to celebrate the different seasons, the spring, summer, fall, winter. There are these junction points, um, and we all are very aware of you know, where the sun is in the horizon. But there are these specific junction points in the calendar year that uh, have this opportunity that if you can celebrate them, they dispel all the negativity from the past season and usher in a whole new wave of positivity.
So we all have this instinct, let's celebrate the winter solstice or the spring equinox or whatever. The, we're hardwired to do that because it, has, it can have such a positive impact on the season moving forward. Bless you. For the farmer, um, always remember the farm is just simply an extension of yourself, an expression of yourself. Adopt some practices that help culture this um, deep, awakened awareness. Uh, meditation, yoga, pranayam, whatever you feel suits you. Uh, take time to culture your abilities with attention and intention to invoke those faculties to help you accomplish what you need to accomplish with less work. Take deep rest and avoid toxic consumption through any of the five senses. Um, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's mentioned that when the word eating is used, uh, the Sanskrit word for eating, it refers to whatever we take into en from any sense. It's not just what we take in through our mouth, it's what we smell, it's what we hear, it's what we see, it's where we go. So be careful with what you're taking in because you know you can go through an experience and you can say, well, I gotta digest this because you actually have to digest it. You, you have to process that. So put yourself in environments that are life-supporting for yourself. Um, I'll kind of go through this a little more quickly. But um, what we found on the farm is, again, the whole was more than the sum of the parts. People were very drawn to come to the farm. And the farm responded that it just um, had so much vitality in the plants and the fruits. and um, the local hospital would get special requests from some of its patients that they wanted our food to help them heal because they felt it made such a difference for them. Or when mothers were nursing, they'd only want to have our food so the babies have the best breast milk. And it just was noticeable. So um, we became a place for gathering. This is, we participated with all of our town of Bedford in this summit. And it's amazing when people come together, the changes that they can make in an environment. We had long farm-to-table dinners, especially around different celebrations, or people would want their birthdays, or a wedding, or a graduation. Um, we had the seasonal celebrations. This was a summer celebration. I threw in a picture of our big sunflower. <laughs> um, the education, we've had so many opportunities to be involved in education. I had a four-minute video here, but I think I'm a little short on time. Um, we helped build several school gardens, which became educational centers for the school. Um, a couple came um, to the farm to learn how to um, create a farm for their art, autistic adult daughter and um, other uh, functionally um, fit autistic adults. And it was called Sustainability in Long Island, New York. And that's Wendy and Gary Kaplan and, and their daughter, Natalie. And then Doug, is Doug still here? Oh, okay. Doug DeCandia and um, several other farmers in our area, we grow for some of the food banks and make donations. You end up with these big harvests. Here's Doug with his um, huge um, kale that he grows. Um, but the farm just became this source of abundance and goodwill for the community. Um, there's this saying, um, the world is my family in the Vedas, Vasudev Katumba Kam. And I wanted to end with this um, very last verse from um, the Rig Veda, the primary Veda of Vedic literature, because I think it speaks to our whole assembly or our whole conference. Go together, speak together, 
Know your minds to be functioning from a common source in the same manner as the impulses of creative intelligence in the beginning remain together, united near the source. Integrated is the expression of knowledge. An assembly is significant in unity. United are their minds in the silent dynamism of all possibilities. United be your purpose. Harmonious be your feelings. Collected be your mind. In the same way as all the various aspects of the universe exist in togetherness, wholeness. So I want to thank you all for your patience in having this kind of sequentially unfold. I know it was a lot of information. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions or... Oh, oh. Thank you. Thank you.